Hey guys, welcome back to Let's Play Fantasy Star 4. Since our last episode, I took care of all of that grinding that I mentioned off screen. And it took about 30 to 45 minutes just fighting those Mata Slugs in the cave that I demonstrated to you guys last time. So before we go into Zyos 4, I want to go over our setup and a few things that have changed since last time. First of which being with Grizz, I purchased a Struggle Axe from Iedo. And for some reason I neglected to go over this last time because I'm a scrub, but I should have. But as you can see here, it's a really good upgrade for Grizz, gives him 12 more attack and more 12 more defense, which is a little interesting because, you know, weapons typically don't come with defense on them, you know, makes sense, right? But for some reason the programmers decided to put 12 defense on this axe, and I'm wondering if that's to help offset Grizz's abysmal agility stat, which if you remember, agility helps determine your physical defense. And since Grizz is kind of geared towards being a tank and, you know, just taking hits, I'm wondering if that's what they had in mind with that. I don't know, maybe I'm giving them too much credit and overanalyzing things, which I tend to do quite often, but, you know, it's there, so there you go. Now, everybody learned some new abilities since last time. Uh, start with Rika. She learned Gires, which is your level 2 healing spell. Heals for about 90, very similar to a Daimi. And she learned the Almighty D-Band buff. Increases everyone's physical defense. Really useful. And she also learned Disrupt. Hits all enemies on the screen for non-elemental damage. It is very good. And, you know, just to go over Rika, you know, one more time, she's just a very, very good character, and she just keeps getting better and better. She's very fast, as you can see there, with 33 agility, good equipment draw, heals, she gets group heals, she gets all the good buffs, good single target DPS, and now she has an AoE attack? Yeah, definitely approve of that. Chaz also learned Gires. He also learned Rimpa, which cures paralysis, and will never be using that spell. And he also learned Githu, which is your next Thunder spell. Really good damage, actually. And he learned Air Slash, which despite its name is not Wind Elemental, it's actually a non-elemental physical attack. It hits everything on the screen. You might remember me mentioning that a few episodes ago. So there's that. Alice, the only thing she learned is Gafoy and Death. If you need to know what Death does, well, I don't know what to tell you, because I'm not going to go over that for you. <laughs> and Han, the only thing he learned is Gawat and Rimmit, which is... It's okay if you want to crowd control your enemies or um, CC them. It's paralysis to um, organic monsters. I won't be using that ever, because just like debuffs, they're kind of crappy. So, yeah. Now, one more thing to go over before we hit up Zyos Fort is now that we have the level 2 elemental spells, you might want to try to put them in for a more powerful version of Tri-Blaster. And unfortunately, you cannot do that. For whatever reason, if you want to use Tri-Blaster, you have to use the level 1 elemental spells. Don't know why. I don't really agree with that myself. It makes absolutely no sense. But for whatever reason, that's the way it is. And that kind of puts a limited use on Tri-Blaster, because eventually the damage is going to plateau off and become kind of obsolete, but for now, it's still okay. What you could do though is upgrade your Blizzard and your Firestorm double techs with the level 2 spells if you want to, and they will do more damage. So that's, that's kind of nice if, you wanna, if you're a fan of those spells. But more importantly, this macro, yeah. Death and Illusion. Now this this double technique is a very special combination. It has to be done in the order that you see here, otherwise it won't work. So you have to keep that in mind if you want to use this. And after I show you what it does, you'd be crazy not to use it. So there we go, I think we're all we're all set up for kick-ass music. Yeah, Zyos Fort, really good music really good dungeon theme, never gets old. Uh, new enemy here, tech user. You could run into them on the world map outside as well. And these guys can be pretty annoying because they have healing magic, and they also have, I think it's a boy. Maybe 
say a lot too. Um, I honestly can't remember because I typically kill them first because they can heal and it's just really damn annoying. So make them a priority. Uh, another new enemy here, Rippers. Nothing too special about these guys. They have a single target physical attack and a fire breath attack, but it's nothing you can't handle. But to elaborate more on the Tech Masters, this is the point in the game where you're going to start running into... Really? Two crits in a row? Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, well, that was unexpected, guys. Christ. What was I saying? Yeah, this is the point in the game where, you know, enemies will start to just bend you over without abandon. Man, that pisses me off. Two crits in a row, that is... Oh, I can't use Tri-Blaster, because Han's dead. Whoops. Anyways, getting back on track to what I was originally saying, is that monsters now are going to start casting spells, uh, both on themselves and on your party. And you'll notice that characters like Han and Rune and your other casters typically take zero damage from spells. And everyone else kind of takes, you know, moderate to extreme damage. And you might wonder where that damage is coming from because nowhere in the game is there a magic defense stat that you can see or determine, you know, is the spell going to hurt this person or that person or what. And what the game does is that it actually uses a character's mental stat to determine their magic defense. You know, we're just going to run from these guys because I really want to get through Zyos Fort in this episode. And now it's just bullshit that Han got his face fucked like that. So, uh, you might try Blaster. Man, that <laughs> just, that really rubs me the wrong way. That is, oh man, I hate random occurrences like that. <laughs> oh man. So I guess all that grinding was for not viewers. Anyway, we're just gonna have you defend. Now somebody actually asked me that... Well, they pointed out that when I mentioned the previous Fantasy Star games, I don't sound too sure of myself. And you would be correct. I have played them. However, I only played them once each. And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, Fantasy Star 3, I was not too... Hey, another new enemy here, Shadow Saber. But, um, yeah, I was not too happy with Fantasy Star 3, and we're just gonna leave it at that. Um, yeah. A couple things about this guy, they can cast D-Ban, which, if you remember me just going over a, moment, a few moments ago, is that it increases physical defense. So you want to kill these guys first if you see them come in a group. And they also have a pretty strong physical attack, so you might want to watch out for that. Definitely make these a priority, along with tech users. Now they also can drop a weapon for Chaz, which they did not drop here. It's not too rare. Um, I wouldn't go out of my way to farm it, because it's not that great of a weapon. And you'll probably get one just from going through the dungeon here. Surprise attack. Yeah, try blaster, since there's no risk of that getting interrupted. Man, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, Fantasy Star 3. Ugh. Well, first of all, 2000 Meseta, awesome. Yeah, that's the black sheep of the series. It, it doesn't even fit in with the other games or the timeline in general. It's just there. Uh, fall down here for a secret Moondu. Finally, this item, it's like a Phoenix down. We can finally revive somebody. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe it revives them at 25% of their max HP. So definitely hang on to that for an emergency, since we're what, like, seven, eight hours into the game and we just now get our first revival item? Oh man. Um, so anyways, yeah, there's Fantasy Star 3. I did go through it once, but I'm not a fan of that game at all. And Fantasy Star 2. I did play through that game once, however, it wasn't all in one sitting. I kind of... I played it first on the Sega channel, 
<laughs> which if you're old enough to know what that is, you can already... I'm sure you can, you know, relate with my pain. And this kind of goes back to what I was mentioning, uh, renting RPGs, and how it was a dark age. And the Sega channel was no different by any means. It wasn't better, and it wasn't worse, but it was definitely just as bad as renting games. Because back then, if you rented a game, or let me back up a second, if you went to rent a game, either at your local Blockbuster, or your Albertsons, or Corner Video Store, you know, whatever you guys had back then, one of two things happened. Either A, you went there to pick it up, and it was there and you took it home and you played it for two or three days and then you brought it back and the person behind the counter gave you a lightsaber for jazz and you know life was good you got to play an RPG and hey you know this is awesome I love this game you took it back and you were kind of sad because you know the experience had to end so you come back a few days later or a week later and you know whatever your parents allowed you to do when it Came to renting games. I know my parents, it was usually every Friday because, you know, the school weekend is it. the weekend, kind of like a little treat. So, oh, going south is a dead end, so don't bother. So let's say, you know, you rent a game and you come back to re-rent it. Now, this is where one of two things happens. Either A, the game is there, and, you know, you take it home and you get to continue on with the game and, you know, everything's fine and dandy or the game is not there and you feel like someone just came up and kicked you in the balls and that your life is over. Now just because the game is there doesn't mean that everything is all sugar and rainbows and everything's perfect in the world. Oh no. Far from it viewers. Now let's say the game is there and you proceed to check it out and you're in the car ride home and you're all excited and you're like yeah I get to play this game again and you rush upstairs, or you rush into your room to put the game in, and you're, you're just mashing the buttons to get through the title screen and the logos as quickly as you can, only to find that your save data is gone. Yeah, it's either completely erased, which it could be due to the game itself, the laser barrier. Uh, that's a shield, actually. We're going to want to give that to Han. Now back then, um, if you didn't, this is more common on the Nintendo, not so much these systems, but the battery backup for cartridges kind of, it was kind of sketch. There were times where it would just die and erase all the data, and it was pretty random, there's nothing you could do about it. So if, if you rented a game and that happened to you, yeah, it sucked, and it would probably piss you off, but there's really, there's really nothing you can do about it except grumble and start a new game and, you know, just go from there. Now, the other possible outcome is that your your save file would still be there. And that would be great because you can just pick up right where you left off and everything would be, you know, perfect. You know, it might require the planets aligning for that to happen. <laughs> because I can tell you 90% of the time, if you rented an RPG for a second or third time and you brought it home, more often than not, your file would be replaced with some other file that is not your own because some fucking asshole took his game and saved over yours. Now, at this point you have two options. <laughs> you could either, well, load his file and help him progress through the game, or you could say, you know what, screw that guy, I'm going to delete it just out of spite. And that's what people usually did, and then they're like, but I really want to play this game. So you start over, because Chaz gained a level, and I don't know. Either way, renting RPGs and playing them on the Sega channel was just a, it's a roll of the dice, and it usually sucked. Especially if, you know, you're trying to play an RPG like this, and you make all this progress, and you have to start over repeatedly. It just really, really kills the experience for you so all that being said that's how I got to enjoy Fantasy Star 2 and needless to say I got pissed off from having to start that game over so many times I just gave up on it for many years and if you've played that game you know that game is ridiculously hard so 
yeah, putting yourself through that torture over and over and over again is not something you want to do. So I finally picked it up years later and played through the game, and, you know, I liked it. It was a good game, um, but I'm not too familiar with it, unfortunately. So let's see... Man, we're fighting a lot of these guys. Uh, Fantasy Star 1. Um, I've also only played once, and that's mainly due to it uses the old-school first-person dungeon crawling mechanic, which I was never a fan of, to be honest, so... I wasn't really as engrossed in the game as I probably should have been, but it was still a good game, you know, I finished it. Um, although I don't remember big details like having to use Alshline in that game to cure Odin of his stone sickness, which is a... Uh, if you remember in this game, that was a pretty big plot point in the beginning, so... Yeah, there's a huge reference to Fantasy Star 1 right there, and how most of the first two games take place on Motavia with Dimates. And so, you know, a lot of the towns from the older games do make an appearance in this one as well. Towns like Zima and some others that we haven't been to yet that we'll get to later. So those are some references as well, and some enemies make an appearance in this game and things of that nature, so there's that. So to answer, um, you know, your question, if you are still following this LP and you want me to recognize that I do pay attention to your feedback and your comments, which I do enjoy doing, viewers, I would love to hear from you guys. Um, yes, I have played the first three games in the series. However, as mentioned, I'm not too familiar with them, so I am sorry about that. Uh, here we get a laser claw for Rika. Alright. We are getting close on time, but we're almost done with this place. It's not too bad. And I just realized I never showed off Lethal Image. Oh man, this probably isn't the, the best example. But you know what? Screw it. I love this double tech. Mm, instant death. All enemies on the screen. I have never seen that miss. Ever. <laughs> it is just one of my absolute favorite combos in the game. Unfortunately, we just learned um, death with Alice, so we can't use it too often. Uh, here's a little better example. I wanted to show you guys a battle with four enemies, but yeah. <laughs> oh man, I, I fucking approve of that combo. It is amazing. And I, I highly recommend using that, you know, abuse the hell out of instant death. And Leneth, no! Oh! Lenneth, lay back down. You are fine all episode, and right at the boss, you decide to stand up in my way. Ah, uh, cats. Anyways, hey, who's this guy? Juza, at last. We meet for the first time for the last time. Wait, who are you again? And why are you relevant to the story? Anyways, find out in the next episode, viewers. I will see you guys then.